Well, hello, friends, and welcome to this edition of Life Talk. This is episode number 12, and I am very happy that you're with us. Thank you for your previous support of all of the episodes that we've had so far. If you've never seen Life Talk before, this is what the program is all about. We talk about the issues of life, and we talk about our Christian faith. We talk about our careers and the calling that God has placed on our lives. Every episode is different because each one of my guests is different and unique, and I am thrilled to have with me Colleen Williams Rennie, and I pronounced it right, didn't I? Yes, you did. Colleen, yes, welcome did. to Life Talk. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. How are you doing today? I'm wonderful. Where are you joining us tonight from? I am in Boston, Mass. Today. Okay, that's wonderful. So you know, you've seen the program before, so you know what the first question that's coming at you is: Who is Colleen? Tell us who you are. So first of all, thank you for having me. You're Colleen great. is a child of God, a woman of God, a mother, a daughter, a friend, a sister, an author, motivational speaker, soccer coach, teacher, and I'm a wife. I'm somebody's wife, finally. <laughs> yes. Okay, that, that's a good place to start again. When you say <laughs> finally, what do you mean by finally? Finally, because I think like after all I've been through, Mm -hmm. And especially this year, 2022 is like, I can finally say I'm happy. Finally, somebody loves me for me, finally. So that right there is just means the world to me. Well, just see where I came from and where I'm at right now. Praise God for that. And we're gonna explore some of that in, in our discussion today. I, I, congratulations. Thank you. I'm glad you're happy. I can see the glow on your face. So everybody uh, said that, yeah. You're definitely marry my regards to your husband. Thank you. Thank you. So were you raised up in a Christian home? I was not. I was born in Trinidad and Tobago, of course, the islands. And I was raised everywhere else except where I was supposed to be. I was actually, I'm now finding out a lot of things where I was actually in an orphanage, in a foster home, raised with this. I was just everywhere. I was just put everywhere. But it's only when I came to America in 1983 I just started following the Christianity, trying to find myself and find who is God and all of the above. So you've been in, in here in US since 1993? 1983. 1983. Yeah. <clears throat> what was it like in an orphanage? Can you share some of your experiences with us? It wasn't present because you're always gonna question, okay, why am I here? Who are these people? Where is my mom? Like, why? You know, you're gonna have a lot of questions. And it was only when I found out, like, so many things I'm finding out as I go along, why my mother hates me. And then I realized where my mother was raised and where she left me. So every day is a learning process. So just being raised without your parents is like, what did I do? You're gonna blame yourself, but you can't blame yourself because your parents didn't know any better. They were young. So how do you get past that self-blame? You wouldn't believe it, my husband. I, 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 I have this thing. I know it's me. I know it's me. It's me. I know it's me. I know I did it. And he's like, every minute, it's not you. It's not you. I blame myself for everything, but it wasn't me. It really was not me. There's nothing. I didn't raise myself. I didn't abuse myself. So it's not me. I didn't do anything. So just him telling me that, I'm like, I feel much better now. So good. I can stop the self-blame. Well, that's good to hear. Yeah. One uh, second. One, oh, my gosh. I'm sorry. Okay. Oh my so, oh my God, I have an emergency. Sorry. Can I cut it real quick? You have to go? Yeah, I, for five seconds. Oh, okay. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Oops. Well, you know, sometimes this does happen with live TV. We're just going to keep rolling here. Um, and I know that uh, Colleen is an author. We're going to talk to her about some of the books that she has written. Uh, and I first met Colleen um, back on Twitter uh, a while back. And so... Um, I expect that she'll be back here in just a few seconds. We all understand emergencies and health. I'm back. Sorry about that. I apologize. That's okay. I was, I was, I was talking to the camera, and did everything okay on your end? I was yes, 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 yes. Where sorry. we met, and that's that's live broadcasting. That's what happens. Wow. 
we have to delete that part. No, it's it's okay. We're running live. It just it is what it is. It's fine. Okay. <laughs> Everything is okay. No, but it sounds like you have a wonderful husband. Where did you meet him? Where I was on a social site. I was on tag. Mm -hmm. And I was just done. I just had enough of everything. I was going through everything. And I just, he was like the last person. And I was just about to block him. And wow. it was a Saturday. We just exchanged numbers. And he couldn't sleep that night. And I'm like, why? He was like, I just want to make sure that you got to work OK. I was like, yeah, right, whatever. First man that never wanted anything from me, respect, love, the best part. My prayer partner. Amen. We pray together. We everything. So I'm just like, yes, yes. I totally relate to that. <clears throat> Crystal and I also met on a social site, and we are also prayer partners, not just ministry partners. And mm -hmm. we, you know, best friends, soulmates, all of it, all down the mm -hmm. line. So I am. If you have found in your life what I have found in my life, then praise God. Yes. And that's why we're both smiling tonight. Yes. Because <laughs> we have our soulmates in our exactly. life. Exactly. Praise exactly. God. I wanted to ask you, were you able to reconcile with your mother at all after what had happened growing up? Nope. She, some people, it just doesn't change. And that's just how she is. She, she's just, she wants to stay bitter. Hmm. And I can't, I can't. I really tried, but I really, she just doesn't want to. It just, it is what it is. And that's it. I did what I had to do. And you have to accept that. And yeah, but after a while, you can't just keep trying and trying and she doesn't want to listen. So hmm. I'm sorry for her. We want to keep praying for that. Uh, right. you, have, you have siblings? Were they in a similar situation? Or are you an only child? I have had four brothers and it's, it's four, four boys and two girls. Mm -hmm. My four brothers were murdered. And my sister, I have no idea where my sister is. So I, I am the only child. So my mother, she just hates everybody. So everybody just moved away. And nobody can deal with that. So everybody had their own lives and it is what it is. So I am sorry to hear about your brothers. I did not know that. Uh, <laughs> it's okay. Wow. Was that in on the islands? Or was that here in America? One in America. Two in, two in America and two in islands. Hmm. Yeah. That's a lot of trauma to go through. It is, but then I met a friend on Twitter, who's, which is you, who sent me to his page and you taught me so much. When you sent me that link, I'm subscribed every, I just learn, you have to learn to deal with it forgive and move on. I was just holding on and holding on and holding on until you sent me that link. And I was like, oh my gosh, this man doesn't even know me. And ever since that, I just learned to take, that's what you said, take it for what it is and move on. And I will never forget that from you. Wow. Never. Um, you just caught me off guard. I mean, you know, it's it's interesting when you're when you're preaching and you're teaching and you're sharing things. And I, you know, you post a lot on Twitter and so do I. Uh -huh. You never know where a message is going to go. Yeah. You never know who's going to hear a sermon or a Bible study. It could be years and years later. Yep. And suddenly someone will reach out, like you're saying right now. I yeah. don't know what specific <laughs> text or whatever you're referring to, but it obviously ministered to you. And all it praises did. to God for it that. It did. Well, that's wonderful. So you got, let me go back to your faith, because I do want to get to, you're an author. And you're a survivor of domestic violence, and we definitely want to talk about that. Right. So you arrive in America in 1983. Take us through the process of your adjustment here to the U.S. and especially how you came to Christ through all of this. The adjustment was hard because for from age birth to seven, I was like in and out of everybody's home. I don't know these people, but that was nothing but sexual abuse, physical abuse all types of abuse and I'm young I'm still looking for my mom and then in 83 she sent for me to come up here and I'm like why as soon as I got here it was like I didn't even get a chance to understand America abuse 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 it was like she regretted it but all I had was my mom so I didn't know what else to do I had to stay with her because I don't know anybody in America so I 
I stayed with her and from ages 13 to 23, I stayed with her abuse. The 23 was when I had my son and then it just kept going on. And I'm like, I can't live like this. And I, everybody kept saying, trust God. I don't know who God is, so I can't trust somebody I don't know. Mm -hmm. So it was like, I was going to this church and when I'm coming back, I met a Jehovah witness and then there's the Mormons. And then I was like, oh my, I was just confused. And I, I'm like, I know there gotta be somebody who's, who keeps me going. I kept praying. I didn't know who I was praying to. And the religion was just crazy. And I'm like, and my mother didn't believe in God. So mm. there was no way that she could have taught me something she didn't know. And, you know, I just kept going to the church, which was like down the street from me. And they kept saying the same thing. Like, yo, you're very persistent. Like, I want to know, like, why am I even here? And it was just the love of God, learning more about him and trying to figure out who he is. Because all I know is for God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son. And I'm like, why would he do that? Like, I wouldn't give my son. And I'm just confused yeah. trying to learn. And I never gave up on God because he never gave up on me. Amen to that. You know, that verse you quoted, obviously, is probably the most infamous, famous verse of the Bible. Most yeah. Well known verse. <clears throat> but it is when you think about it. I wouldn't have given my son. Right. <laughs> I wouldn't have done it. And you're saying you wouldn't have done it, but God did it. Yes. And it shows how much he loves us. And if he yes. loves us that much, what do we owe him back? We owe him everything. Exactly. Everything. And so when you, when you come to that truth and you realize what, I mean, we just came through the resurrection season. Yes, we did. Week, you know, at church and, and you're looking at all the things that Jesus did and not just his suffering, but the fact that he took on all of our sins upon mm -hmm. him. You know, God turned his back on him and he was hanging on the cross and he felt forsaken. And yeah. how do you not just embrace that? Yes, yes. Regardless of whatever we're going on down here, uh, Jesus went through infinitely more than anything. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Of us will go through. Well, I praise God that you came to some truth. Are you plugged into a church now where you're at? Are you attending somewhere? I'm, they closed. They still, they, sometimes they open, sometimes they close, so. Was that from the COVID? Yes. Yes. Okay. So sometimes I do it online. Yes. I, mm -hmm. They're going to open up soon. So I'll go back out soon. Okay. Well, that's good. Um, let's get into, because um, you have experienced domestic violence. Uh, I don't know if you want to start there or maybe start with some of the books that you've written about that, but I do want to explore that with you because you and I'm sorry that that happened to you. Domestic violence is probably more widespread than any of us realize. Yes, it is. Can you talk to us a little bit? Tell us, what is domestic violence? How, would, how is that defined? Domestic violence is any type of abuse. Domestic violence, domestic abuse is any type of abuse put on someone. It's not just women, because a lot of people think it only happens to women. It happens to women and men. Mm -hmm. I, myself, I've been a victim of sexual abuse, domestic violence, and how can i say it i'm learning more i don't know where the book is but i'm learning more of why it happens there's no excuse why it happens but i do understand the men some men well especially in the islands some men they see what their parents go through so when they grow up that's all they know so that's why they do what they do they can only be they can only do what has been done or what they saw so my my whole thing was my first domestic violence and my books go together so my first relationship was domestic violence i didn't do anything he had issues he put his hands on me and that was done and it just kept going people would people would say oh try again not everybody's the same it seemed like everybody i was with turned out to be the same mm. because it was just abuse after abuse after abuse so my book i wrote a book is called stop and the reason why I wrote that is because in 2009, first marriage, and I moved to Trinidad in November just to be with him. Got married January 24th, 2009. I got married January 24th, January 25th. He already put his hands on me and kicked the baby out of my stomach. Oh. Oh, I'm supposed to understand that's his religion. He's an Ethiopian Orthodox. So. I'm supposed to be quiet and I'm supposed to listen to him. And I'm like, whatever. 
I'm uh, stuck. I don't know of any religion where you can kick a woman in the stomach exactly. and lose a child. Uh, He's, uh, they go up in the mountains and then they come back down. And I was confused about the whole thing. I don't understand it. I don't want to understand it. But these men abuse their woman and I'm supposed to understand that. Not me. I'm not understanding anything. No way. So I was stuck there. You can't just leave. You can't just walk away. You're stuck in front of that. You don't know nobody. Another thing, these men, I, these men isolate you from your friends and family so they can have you right where they want you. And I escaped in March, came back to America, started over again. And same thing, go ahead. That's when you came back in, in 1983? No, this happened in 2008. I left Boston to go to Trinidad because we've been friends for like three years, back and forth traveling. And I decide to marry him, to bring him up here to live with me. So that brings up this question. Did you not see any warning signs? None. Zero. Nope. Nope. How is, I can't, I, maybe this is a dumb question. How is that possible? How because, do you not, I'm not saying you didn't see it, but generally, how can someone who's an abuser hide it so well that they wait until you get there you marry them, and the very next day, he's putting his hands on you and causes you to lose a baby. But exactly. in the previous three years, you didn't see any, no red flags. Nope, because they're actors. That's that mask that they put on. Hmm. They're actors. They're pretending they're amazing. They're wonderful men. No. Remember, I'm in Boston. He's in Trinidad. So we're not, I'm not seeing him every single day. We right. just travel every now and then. So when I go down there for like two weeks, he's the perfect fiance. When I come back up here... I don't, even when I went down there and I started going to church on Sundays, everybody was laughing. It was like, he never goes to church, all acting. We got married in the church. It was a priest. I told the priest, listen, this man is putting his hands on me. And he was like, well, you're going to have to learn to, no, you have to prepare. I'm like, prepare for what? I'm not preparing for anything. That's just, that's how they are in the islands. So the advice you were given is prepare. Prepare. Prepare yep. to be abused. Exactly. Because that's just what, it, and I'm like, no, not me. Sorry. Wow. And I left. Wow. Yep. Um, wow. That's, that's really, it's actually sad. So you said, I mean, some, some guys, some men, they see it happens in their parents. So it's generational. It's a generational plus certain things that women say like me, I have no brothers. I don't have anybody. I'm by myself. Yeah. They listen to those words. Okay, she's soft, she's gullible, she's vulnerable. Mm, I can get her right where I want her. And that's what I do. I tell, I talk too much and I give them too much. So I learned, but that's what happened. And that's where that book Stop came from because I was in the room and he was putting his hands on me and my son, he was like 11. He just came in the room and he was like, stop hitting my mommy. Hmm. And when his little hand went up, that's where that came from. Stop. Makes perfect sense. And now, it was like right there. I just wrote my whole pain. Just based on that because mm -hmm. of his hand. Now, obviously tremendous trauma in an 11 year old. Yeah. His mother being abused. How did, how did you handle that? And how is he doing now with having experienced that? I mean, there's more. He's now 26. Okay. So from the time he saw that till last year, he's, I mean, he's going through his things, but it's like, I keep him away from it. Mm -hmm. I don't tell him anything. It's only if he reads about it or if he actually heard about it, because after my first marriage, we can fast forward. I got with another guy probably four years ago. Same thing. And I'm just like, are you kidding me? He, um, I moved to Ohio to be with him. Oh, excuse me. He's a deacon in the church. So that's where, how I met you, because I was lost and confused and I didn't know what I'm supposed to be doing until you showed me how to do it. I keep running after all these men. I was supposed to be running after God. That was my mistake. I was looking because they're men of God. So I believe that. So I moved to Ohio to be with him. And in July, in August, I was, yeah, in August, he took out a life insurance policy to get me killed, but the gun jammed. Yeah, this is a man of the God. Walked away from that. 
he came back up in October to this door to finish me off. So he tried to kill me on my birthday. It didn't work. He came back in October to kill me on my son's birthday. That didn't work. So now he's doing probably 20 years now. He, he did his first five. So now he's doing like 20 years now. And it's like my entire life. I'm just trying to find God, but I didn't know who was God or Jesus. So I'm, oh, I like this guy because he can, you know, they said a man who brings you close to God is a man to keep, but God is not lost. So a man can't bring you anywhere. God is like right there. Yeah. And you know, and I don't know this man, but I, and you know what, in talking to you now, uh, it explains a lot of your tweets. <laughs> yes. But, but that's a good thing. Yeah. Because you're warning not only other women, but you're also, because I, I read your tweets. I They roll up on my tweets. They <laughs> yeah. may roll up on yours, right? But you have, there's certain themes that you focus on. Mm-hmm. And you're speaking from experience. And you're also speak, you're, you're flashing warning signs to yeah. women and to men as well. Yeah. These are the things you need to watch out for. Mm-hmm. Just because a man calls himself a man of God or a woman says, yeah. I'm a man of God does not mean they are. Exactly. And it's, and it's folks like that that give us a bad name out mm-hmm. there. Where somebody says, well, I don't want to go to church because I was abused by a man of right. God. Therefore, right. I don't want to trust another man of God. Exactly. Uh, wow. You, you have had like more than your share of trauma. I've had, I, I did. I'm, I'm still going through one more as we speak, although I'm married. Like these men, the thing is they want you dead. That's just it. But, are, uh, let me make sure I understand. You're married, yeah. obviously happily married, but mm-hmm. are you saying you still have another situation that you're trying to defuse even because though Because he's not going to leave his words were, he's not going to leave me alone unless I'm dead. Those are his words. And I'm, I mean, I'm good. I'm fine. I have my restraining order. I'm good. He's in jail, but he's sending people to my job to attack me. He's not going to give up, but I'm a firm believer in God. I, I'm good. I'm trust me. I trust God. I'm good. Can I ask? And I know he's not. Sure, on, you can ask anything. He's not on camera. How is your husband handling all this? I know how I would be handling this. <laughs> And I don't want to say because I'm a man of God. Right. But I know how I would be handled. How is your husband handling this, knowing that th- this is happening to you? It's hard because, I mean, he prays a lot. But once that that whole thing where I'm to blame, when I was blaming myself, once we both realized I was never the problem, it's out of our hands. We really got to leave it up to God now because I didn't do anything wrong. Again, I didn't even fall in love. I just... I was in Connecticut and this is where I'm at right now, but I was in Connecticut and I met this guy who I've known for a while. And he was like, you know, let's get together and rebuild. And I'm like, okay, that's cool. I came back up to Boston in this house, Mm -hmm. rebuild what? He's homeless. He has nothing to offer. He's bringing other men and women. He's bringing other men and women in my house without my permission. And I'm like, you can't do that. All I said, I went downstairs. It was me, the lady, the guy, and my son. We just talked about Colleen getting her life together. That was it. It turned into an argument, a fight, slash my son's tires. I'm like, what? He want to fight me. He want to kill me. Police. I'm like, took out a restraining order. Just went back this February to extend it. Now he sent someone to my new job to, I don't know, I guess they use the word violate, to threaten me. So now the guy, I'm just like nonstop. So April, so tomorrow, the 22nd, I got to go to court just to go to court. And May 3rd, they're both about to be sentenced again. And I'm not doing anything. And my, my husband says the same thing. I don't do nothing but go to work and come back home. I go to, that's all I do. And I've always been like a laid back, quiet person, but these men, they just have some rage in them. What was it that, I'm sure you figured it out because you've written, you've written on it and, and, and I thank God that you have survived all of this abuse. <laughs> I think you've I talked do. now of where you've actually moved and you've traveled a couple places to meet yeah. men. Have you yeah. figured out what it is that's, that you keep doing that? I mean, what is the- I am. Um, looking for love is it, he said uh, it 
they're, Isn't they're that good it? talkers or what that's is what it? it was i was just looking for love i just trust everybody and i don't have a mother i don't have a father i don't have anybody so it's like the first man and it was never love i was just really helping him out but after a while you get tired of helping a grown man you know mm -hmm. so he just couldn't take he just couldn't take it and that was it and i'm like wow so well, you have a covering now with your husband mm -hmm. so covering you in prayer and he's covering your house all he's everything everything so and i'm blessed for that. let's talk about your book it's called stop mm -hmm. do you happen to have a copy handy that you can hold up or we certainly want to know uh where we can get copies of it so this book is, it called is stop yeah. and it's just my real life story about everything that has happened to me and it's available on amazon.com but blinded by love is also my book which i was actually the reason why i wrote this book because i was blinded i was actually advocating for other women and i couldn't even advocate for myself I was helping other women and I couldn't even help myself. And I'm actually in a relationship and I'm just like, what did I do again? Which is nothing. Yeah. So I'm just like, you gotta be kidding me. And I will never blame myself again. Good. Because my son and the guy, they packed up my stuff and we drove to New York together when I moved to New York. Mm -hmm. I got to New York at eight o'clock by 8 15. The 77th precinct was at the house. And I'm like, what happened now? His, he lost his mother and he lost his sister. What does that have to do with me? So he took it out on me. And I'm like, you know what? I'm good. I'm done. I'm done with men. And that's when I went on the site and I found Mr. Rennie. And I'm like, yo, you're not real. You can't be real. You can't be not after everything that's happened. Not after everything I've been through, but I know I deserved it. So I deserve what God had for me. So I'm Amen. blessed. Amen. In all of these years of abuse, have you ever gone into therapy or needed any kind of counseling to help you through? And if so, how, how did it help you? I've been in therapy for two years. It just came to an end. Wednesday. Tuesday was my last day of therapy because I love her. She came in. She did what she's supposed to do mm -hmm. and she left. She's moving to DC and it's because of her. I got my new release Look from bitter and broken to beautiful and blessed. Congratulations. So thank you. It was her, like she came in mm -hmm. and she removed all of that. All get rid of it. Let's go move on. And she just taught me know your worth. You know what you deserve. Choose you. And she did her job and I, no one knew I had teeth cause you couldn't never see me smiling, very negative, always cussing. But mm -hmm. that husband of mine and that therapist, I'm on my way to whatever God has for me. Which is, are you planning to write some more books? What are, what are your plans for the future? My, my next book is gonna be, it's coming out on June 13th and it's called My Mother's Secrets. And that's because my dad just, I just buried my dad, I think in October. And I'm like, okay, listen, I'm 49. This is like the third man I buried. That's my dad. Mm. So my mother just keeps lying. You know, she just constantly lying about everything. And I'm like, this is my chance to talk to you because she don't like to listen. So I wrote her a story of what I've been through from the time I was born till seven to nine to 13. Because I keep notes and I'm like, listen, you, you can't do this to me. Somebody hurt you, you can't hurt me. So I'm doing that one. And next one is called Just Have Faith. And it's just about everything. It's almost like a diary type thing. Like Yes, yeah. Kind of I documented yeah. everything. This date, this time, this is where I was. This was my dad. Now this is the other dad. Here comes another dad. I can't, you shouldn't be putting me through this. I didn't do anything to you. So... Yeah. So I just have to let her know, like, and I picked June 13th because June 13th will make it one year I've been baptized. That's how I learned to forgive and let go. Mm -hmm. When I went down in that water, I left everything there, mm -hmm. came back up a different person. And I forgave her because she couldn't love me because nobody loved her. One thing I've learned in my life, I've learned a lot of things, but as far as unforgiveness, mm -hmm. we're told to forgive over and over and over again. Right. And 
unforgiveness is like a cancer inside of you. It just eats you alive. Yes, it does. It does. Cause it makes you like, I want to say something. You hold on for too much. Yeah. I want to say gotta something. Forget. I my parents, I was raised, my father was very outspoken. So if, if he didn't, let's say if my dad didn't like you, he would simply look at you in the face and say, I don't like you. And it, he would let all those emotions out. Oh, my wow. mother buried everything down. Mm. My father was never on medication for like nerves or something like that. My mother was on anxiety medication because everything was pushed down. So I learned from my dad, let it out. <laughs> let it out. Yes. But, so it's one thing to let out anger or just to say to someone, hey, I don't like you. I don't like what you did. Mm -hmm. When it comes to forgiveness, that's something that eats away at us. It does. We really don't truly forgive someone. It does. You know, and part of the Lord's prayer is what? Forgive us our debts or our trespasses as we yeah, forgive it others. Does. Yes, let's just so, pass against us. Imagine all of the emotion that we keep inside of ourselves and all of the stress that we put on ourselves because we didn't we don't forgive and it's not easy to forgive is it oh it's not it's not but once we find that once we find i forget it's total freedom yes so true. you're now you're an author you've got two books with more coming out was that your plan along the way did you want to be a writer or did you nope. kind of fall <laughs> into that i did not want to write anything it's just every i guess it's because of everywhere i go and i tell my story you should write a book you should write a book. And I'm like, I don't want to write no book. But when God says go, you just go. <laughs> so oh, do I know that? That's it. It doesn't matter what you want. It's what he says. And I just been writing. And I mean, the sales are not that great, but the messages are. People are getting the story. They're getting the message. They're understanding why I was so shy, why I was so quiet, why I just like to be by myself, you know. And, you know, Mother's Day is coming up. So it's like, yeah. It hurts to be, to know that your mother hates you. And it's like, what did you do? But now that I forgave her, I'm good. I'm going a, I'm to a work on me and I'm yeah. going to be the best mother I can be for my son. Of course. So that's it. And you want to pray for your mom. And I know you do. Of course. You know, I still because pray for you want to see her come to salvation too. You know, yes. we're all, we're all going to stand before that same God one day. Yes, we are. So, uh, you know, we need to be ready for that. Is there, a, and I wanted to ask you this, you know, there are obviously male abusers, but there's female abusers as well. Mm -hmm. Can you talk to us about some of the similarities and maybe there's differences between how a man abuses and a woman abuses? Well, female abusers, they have the, their verbal, their mouth, because they feel like this is a woman's world and they get to do what they want. They get to disrespect these men like I have a friend who's in that situation right now, who the wife does whatever she wants to do, puts her hands in his face, disrespect and make him feel like he's nothing. That's verbal abuse. It messes with his head because when he goes to work, it's like he feels like he's nothing, although he's a hard worker. You know, there's women that if I don't do if you don't do this for me, I'm going to call the police or they hold the kids over the over their head. All that type of abuse. They do it because they they know when the police comes, they're gonna take the men because that's how this world is. It's just like, oh yeah, the men are the abusers and the aggressors. Women are just as bad. In my country, Trinidad, it's kill or get killed. There is no restraining order. There's no, let's go to court the next day. It's never been like that. It's listen, this happened, he killed her, she killed him. That's it, move on. So uh, not, not to put, you know, put too much of a category on it. So on the women's side, maybe women abusers are more ver verbal. And it's verbal, and it's physical. They do things, but they do it because they know the men are not going to say nothing because the men is like they wimps or they punks. So the men are never going to go and be like, well, my wife abuses me. How is that going to look? I understand. So, so they don't say much because they're supposed to be strong and they're supposed to be the men. So the reported cases of a man saying I'm being oh yes oh it's low much lower because lower. There's, there's ego involved there's mm -hmm. you know macho and exactly. I'm a man and I don't want everybody to know my wife exactly there are so many different kinds of abuse and shame on us as a human human race that we do this to one another you know sexual abuse and there's verbal abuse physical abuse emotional you know, abuse emotional abuse financial abuse. And violence, Spirit, spiritual abuse. There's that Ooh. too. Let's talk about that one. That's I'm very important. 
Tell us about spiritual abuse. That one you don't, we don't hear much. You hear physical and sexual. Right. What's spiritual abuse? Spiritual abuse is mostly like what I've been through. Mm -hmm. When these men are supposed to be men of God, but they're just abusing the their authority, they're abusing the word, they're abusing to make to bring women in, making them feel like they're doing something, but they're not. Um, in a couple of friends I have, they also write books. And when you read their books, it's telling you the same thing. I don't want to tell her business, but I'm gonna, it's like this woman knows what her son is doing in the church. Mm -hmm. And you're not saying anything. You just keep allowing it. But then you're using the Bible as you're using all these scriptures trying to cover up what your son is doing. Okay. Um, there's a church down the street. I also teach soccer. I used to teach soccer at that church, but I know what's going on. It's on the news. I know what these priests are doing. I can't say anything because every time I say something, I need to mind my business. It's not true. Mm. Spiritual abuse. They're bringing these young kids in the church. Oh, we're doing Bible study. You're using the church. You're using the Bible to molest little kids. So spiritual abuse falls under all of that. And it's like they always want to use the church and they always want to use God and they always want to use this scripture. They always want to cover up something. You're actually abusing the spirit. You're abusing those, right, I understand. however you can say, those different churches. You're, tw you're twisting scripture. To yes, get, uh, yes. What you believe is true or believe uh -huh. is right. Uh -huh. so I'll tell you, one of, the, one of the most abused scriptures, I'm sure you know, well, that women are to be submissive to their husbands, right? I mean, I, I can't tell that. you how many sermons over the years I have heard where that yeah. scripture has been taken out of context and twisted all around. Yeah, women are nothing more than welcome mats. Exactly, and that's not. There's no. You don't see Christ ever talk about that, or you never see Jesus treat women like that, or even advocate anything close to that. They took it the wrong way and they made it into their way. Yeah, it's like, oh, we, my wife needs to be submissive to me. Therefore, you know, I can beat on her or yes. knock her down verbally or whatever I'm going to do. And she has to be submissive to me. That's exactly. Nonsense. That's nonsense. Tell us this, Colleen, and you're giving us a lot of great information and we, we, we really appreciate it. And sorry that you've gone through this, but you've almost become, uh, I know you're an advocate. You're also a motivational speaker, aren't you? Tell us about that part of your life. So before COVID, I was able to travel to jails and prisons and shelters and, you know, just speak to women. It's two different type of jails I went to, the victims and also the abusers. And these women were in there for abusing their men or killing their men or attempting to kill them. And I was just letting them know that you didn't have to go that far. You should have never been here, but try to, you know, just giving them different ways how they could have helped it. And like, I speak to like a group, not a whole congregation because it's not that many because they're not gonna be there that long. So now they know when they get out, this is what you're gonna do, stay away. But these women are just like me. We didn't know any better. And I'm a type of person like, hold up. I bought all that stuff. I'm not walking away. So we always wanted to fight back, but it's not really worth it because we have our lives and we can always get something else, you know? So I motivate them and I let them know that, you know, since you're sitting here, if you're gonna be here for a year, you can write, you can take a class, you can better yourself. You, you know, I teach them how to know their worth because a lot of us don't know our worth. You know, we just settle for whatever we're getting. Mm -hmm. And a couple of them I stayed in touch with, but since it's COVID, you know, everything has been closed down. And I'm hoping that I can go back out there and do motivational speaking to teach others, look where I came from, look where I'm at now. If you can do it, if I can do it, I know you can do it. Tell me what you think of this statement. Uh, the first time he lays a hand on me, or the first time he abuses me in any way, I'm walking away and not looking back. Is that the proper I, way to do that? And no, please. No, I was that woman. I said the same thing. I watched Jerry, I watched Maury, I watched Steve. Oh, I wish that was me. And if that was me, I would have done, yeah, okay, that was me. Easy to say, but it's hard to do because when you're walking away, the man is losing their power. 
you can never just be you can never just walk out there's no where you're gonna go Mm. there's no way you're going to come back a lot of women say it not too many does it it's very hard to just walk away because that's when they're gonna come and attack you they want to win they're gonna kill you they're gonna put their hands on you it's gonna be a fight it's gonna take a minute for the police to come it's just too much so it's easy for them to say it ain't i know myself if i could have walked away i would have but i couldn't because I was always moving to Connecticut or moving to New York or moving to Ohio. I always moved away from my son. Mm-hmm. You know, I didn't want my son to see that. So he heard about it, but he was never physical. He only saw it once and that was the last time. So I know when they say when a, a child see a man loving their mother the right way, they'll be more happier. So Kevin has been amazing. So, you know, my son Colin is like coming around now and he knows there's not going to be no more abuse, no more hospital visits, no more tears. This it's not going to be anymore. That's great. That's I'm glad you're finally happy. A couple more things before mm-hmm. we wrap things up. Uh, I think all of us understand like the major uh, signs of abuse. You know, physical abuse. Uh, are there subtle little things? Something that you can share with us that maybe you know an average person may have said, "Well, he doesn't." curse me out and he doesn't throw me against the wall but abuse is still there is there something some red flags something that we should be looking out for on both sides with men and women yeah abuse is like if if i say i'm going to work like i work wednesdays and then the week on the weekends if i say i'm going to work i'm going to work you don't need to be they'll call you keep you on the phone what are you trying to see hear the background even if you're home Oh, let, let's do video. You may think they want to see you. They want to know who you're in the house with. I understand. So it's just little, little things like they keep calling you. They know you're at work. So funny. I'm at work and I was doing the cover charge over here and the bar is down here. My manager comes up with the phone and calling some girl name. So I'm telling my manager, don't do it. You're in a bar. Everybody has a cell phone. So right there, the boy, the girl must have told the boyfriend she was going somewhere. I didn't answer the phone. The boyfriend called the bar. And my man, I'm, I'm like, no, don't give. And then I was like, that, no, don't do it. He's going to find out if she's really there. Just say you don't know how you didn't see her. And after my manager hung up, I told her, I was like, listen, don't ever do that again. That has to work out between them. Because what if she said she was going with her girlfriends and she's really at the bar. You know what I'm saying? She has a cell phone. If he needs to get in touch with her, let him get in touch with her. I see it every single day around here, walking the street. I just see fighting, men slapping women. And it's like, it's a normal thing now. Cause me as an advocate, if I step in, I can get stabbed, I can get shot. And then when I, when the men get arrested, the woman cries, like don't lock him up, but he was just beating you. So it's so many red flags and I don't want to say once they do it, they're always going to do it, but you got to wait for them to change. You can't just take them back like that. If you, you can't, they're not going to change because they went to jail for one night. Mm -hmm. No. I I know based on your, you know, obviously your books and the tweets and all this sounds like this is a, this is a passion for you. This is is. calling of your life. Like this is what God has called you to do. This is, this is, yep. To stand up and be a voice for abused people. Mm-hmm. women maybe and men as well both because both, both. i didn't have a voice i couldn't talk okay. so, i i couldn't talk i couldn't say anything because a woman's supposed to stay in her place and i'm like what i felt like i was a child on punishment every relationship i'm just like we can't do nothing we can't go anywhere i can't be on the phone i can't be on social media so what was the whole point of starting a relationship then yeah Amen. And it, so I'm I'm glad I'm out of that, but I'm able to teach women like, listen, get to know this person first. You wouldn't be able to do what you're doing if it wasn't for your strong faith in Jesus. Exactly. Strong faith in God and the word of God. There's exactly. no way that you could do this. No way. No There's way. not a chance. And so we nope. give praises to God for that. Yes, we do. Uh, two last things, Colleen. And again, I'll thank you now for, for doing this. And you're and, more than welcome. Thank you so uh, much for having me. You are you are welcome. Any final words for our listeners and viewers, number one, and number two, if someone wants to reach out and get in contact with you, 
what's the best way to do that? So number one, my last words are trust God, go straight to God. Don't try to find it in anybody else. God is right there. Jeremiah 29 is my favorite of the Bible for the, for I know the plans I have for you. He knows the plans. So no one else has these plans, but him. So go straight to him. If you don't know how drop on your knees, ask for guidance, ask, seek, knock, and he will answer you. Just wait for him to answer, but trust God. Have faith, no matter what you're going through, you will be able to get over it. If I can do it, I know you can. Amen, great work. And I'm on Facebook, Colleen Williams Rennie, and I'm also on Twitter, Empress Colleen One. And my books, Stop, Blinded by Love, From Bitter and Broken to Beautiful and Blessed, all can be found on amazon.com. Awesome. Look at that. Thank you, Reverend O'Connor. You are you are very welcome, <laughs> Colleen. Thank you for being here. And, and friends, thank you for joining us here for this edition of Life Talk. You know, we are live every Thursday with a new guest each week. So thank you again for your support. Um, Colleen, I'll make sure you get a copy of this. Thank you so much. Thank Have an you. amazing day. Thank you for being here with us. Friends, okay. we'll see you soon here on Life Talk. God bless you. Bye-bye.